Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Teach Outdoors. I'm your host, Lauren McLean, and today's episode is going to be all about how to take your curriculum outside. And before we dig in, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the unceded and traditional territories we each find ourselves on today. For me, I live on Heritage Mountain in Port Moody, British Columbia. So to the east of me are the Golden Ears Provincial Parks. And when I look over there to the west, I see the Burrard Inlet, which feeds into the Pacific Ocean with lots of orca whales visiting right now. This is the land of the Quiquitlam First Nations. We have an amazing guest today, Rachel Tidd. She's the author of Wild Learning, Practical Ideas for Bringing Teaching, Outdoors, and the Wild Math and the reading curriculums. She is passionate about integrating the outdoors and natural materials in core academic areas such as reading and math. Prior to founding Wild Learning, Rachel gained extensive teaching experience as an elementary and special education teacher through homeschooling her two children. She's a doctoral student in educational sustainability at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point and holds a master's degree in elementary and special education from Banks Street College of Education. You can find her at discoverwildlearning.com and on Instagram and Facebook at Discover Wild Learning. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for connecting with me. Hi, I'm so excited to be here and talk with you today. I'm on my favorite subject of all things. Uh, mine too. It's perfect. <laughs> Would you like to further introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your background in outdoor learning? Sure. So like you said, I'm Rachel Tidd, and I'm author of the new book, Wild Learning, Practical Ideas to Bring Teaching Outside. And um, I first got um, started in outdoor learning when my kids went to Forest Preschool. Um, they're tweens and teens now, so it's a while ago. Uh, but um, yeah, they both are really different kids and they both really thrived outside. And my youngest um, in particular had pretty significant sensory needs. Mm -hmm. And when we were having him evaluated at three and four, right, in preschool, um, I brought the paperwork to the teachers to have them fill out the, the scales for the evaluation. And, and they thought I was nuts. So, mm. um, and I was like, wait, we're pulling our hair out. I'm a special educator. I'm like, not making this up. Like this is, this is a problem at home. Right. And they said, well, it's, we have no issues here. And, you know, through the evaluation process, we really felt the, the occupational therapist really felt that it was because the outdoor environment was meeting his sensory input needs in a way that the other environments were not. And it makes sense to not, you know, we think about it, you're allowed to bounce on a log and hang from a tree and play on the ice and dig in the snow and balance on logs, right? And if you're an input seeker, yeah, that's going to make a huge difference. And so he was lucky in that I was already homeschooling my oldest and he's the youngest. So to me, I was like, okay, how am I going to, you know, we can't stay in preschool forever. Unfortunately, wouldn't that be lovely? No. Um, you can't stay there forever. Um, and I knew I'd have to teach him to read and do math right? right and um I mean I'm a big play play advocate but eventually this was going to have <laughs> happen and it was going to be my responsibility um and I knew that I had if I this was like a golden ticket like I had to figure out how to incorporate it mm -hmm. and when I looked around what do you find lots of great science units yep especially for older kids um lots of you know inquiry-based science investigations for younger kids, fabulous stuff, yeah. but you got to learn how to read and do math. And so I started with the math. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, maybe it just seemed easier. Um, and people in my homeschool community um, saw what I was doing, got really interested. Um, several people, a, a good friend of mine urged me to write it down. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> I had two young kids. I was like, no one wants to see this. I'm just, you know, hang, playing around in the woods. But eventually I did write it down as uh, informal as it was at the time. And it just grew in popularity. And then that same child was has dys dyslexia and dysgraphia and dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I went down the road of, um, you know, reading and uh, the science of reading and Orton mm -hmm. Gillingham, how to teach that same child outside. How do you teach him to read? Um, and so that's how wild reading came about. That's amazing. I love hearing the personal stories in the background because I mean, you can just hear it in your voice. There's so much passion behind it, right? I, I understand your perspective about why you believe it's so important to connect literacy and numeracy into outdoor education. I know we come from opposite ends of North America. <laughs> so thank you for staying up. Um, and it, But it sounds like our curriculum is very similar where it's still Base, the two foundations are numeracy and literacy. It's so important. So do you have experience with multiple grade levels of bringing numeracy and literacy outdoors or is it typically with with the younger students? So I did because um, I had two kids. So mm -hmm. and I taught elementary and special ed, mostly special ed. Um, so I taught mostly first, third, fourth, fifth and sixth. And um, as my kids got older, I moved up and mm -hmm. wrote different levels. So wild math goes up to fifth grade, um, sixth grade. I always say people are like, are you, what about sixth grade? I'm like, well, sixth grade is fifth grade all over again. And they throw in like three extra units. So it's okay. like, it's like fractions all over again. Cause it just takes kids um, so long to get those concepts, fractions and decimals, those operations, they want them solid before moving to middle school. But, yeah. um, and then I, I've done level one and level two, which is like a grade two level reading um, and a lot of units, but I, I am an elementary educator, so I haven't gone higher yeah. um, in the demand, unfortunately. And I'm hoping this will change and I'm seeing it a little bit, um, I, it's a little bit different in Canada mm -hmm. than it is in the U.S., but um, nature-based education, outdoor learning is a, a early childhood thing here. It is very new to be doing this at all. If you can find, I know a few um, schools doing it, um, but I'm very envious of my Canadian neighbors that uh, get out a lot more than I do uh, or teachers here seem to be able to do do and I'm I'm hoping that the book helps uh to move that into a different direction so. yes absolutely I think it definitely will we love every educator parent loves a good book especially ones that have such practical ideas like your book offers yeah that was yeah. really important to me when um Wiley and Jesse Bass the publisher approached me about writing the book um I they kind of, they're like, what do you want to write about? Which really shocked me. And I was yeah. like, I don't know. Um, but um, I was really adamant that I wasn't going to write another book about school gardens. I love school gardens, but I feel like they're a very privileged, small, um, most schools that I have ever worked at and know of around here just don't have them. Um, and they don't have the funds to have them. And what do you do if you're in New York City? Um, which I, that's where I went for my graduate work and I taught down there for a while. Um, so I was really kind of, I kind of said, I will only write this book if it's super practical. Yeah. Um, it has to be something that's going to give teachers a tool um, to teach what they're already teaching in a way that's outside. And I, I, I otherwise I wasn't going to write it. I was just like, no, nope, this yeah. is, this yeah. is what I'm willing to do. And um we had there's a lot of great books out there that have already kind of covered that you know how to, why we should go outside and and uh, I don't know like how to make a beautiful school schoolyard and yeah yeah well and that's something that I definitely wanted to ask you was because I, I can read it in your blog on your website that you always come at everything with an inclusive lens. And so I know for you, it's not about having a forested space to be outside. So do you have any examples of either literacy or numeracy where you're going outside in a variety of spaces? I do. In fact, I decided to organize the whole book that way. Um, so I, you know, a lot of nature books do it seasonally mm -hmm. or um, what things like that, but I did it by the schoolyard. 
out to the neighborhood and then farther afield and then in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time in that schoolyard because of my experience teaching in a super urban um, I'm actually from a really rural places, but I taught some some of my teaching experiences in an urban area and where you only have the rooftop mm -hmm. playground or they close the street off or they have a, 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 a schoolyard that's all paved and it's, you know, it's only 20 feet yeah. the length of the building. Yeah. Um, and so it's a really different um setting but I don't think that it's it's any there's pros and cons to both and so things that I like to do in a, an, a paved schoolyard I love chalk yep. um, I love you know making your 10 frames with chalk playing grammar games with chalk there's so many I have a whole chapter on chalk because I love chalk because it's mm -hmm. cheap it is and you can do it anywhere I take chalk here um we just moved but I lived in the forest in our last house and we didn't have any pavement we didn't have any sidewalks and so we would draw on the deck we would draw on rocks I would take chalkboards out with me um but then the best part about like a more urban or if your school is in a town like a village or a town like ours mm -hmm. is here um you can use that environment because it's super um, literacy rich. Yeah. And so you can use, so I often give the example, it's weird, I don't have like a slide, um, but mm -hmm. I often give the example, there's a picture I took outside of our public library of the the, the 15 minute parking spaces. Mm -hmm. And it also says, it says no parking, you know, 15 minute spaces, you know, 15 minutes. Um, and so, I use that as an example of like what you could do on the spot. So 15 minutes is a rate. How many yeah. cars can park here in an hour? I have four spots. Now, how many cars, right? Now we've got multiplication. We have rates, which are a big sixth grade thing. Yeah. Um, and then there's the words themselves. So um, parking is an AR, you know, an R controlled vowel. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how many other our controlled vowels can we find on the signs around here? Um, you can mark up the word park. Mm -hmm. You know, you circle that our controlled vowel. Let's add it's parking. So it has a suffix on it. Um, it has the K sound at the end, but it's not CK. There's just like so much you can do when you have text all over. And yeah. the best part is it's like real it's like in context, it's real. It's not something we're making up. It's not some random sentence I wrote on the board. It's like a real context. Yeah. Um, so they can make those connections. And I think it's a little bit more meaningful. Um, so that's what you can do in town. Well, and I love, I love how your example also is one moment, but it's seeing all the curricular connections. So it's not saying that we uh, have to have a numeracy lesson over here. Okay. Tie it up, put it in a box over right. here. Here's our literacy lesson. Or sometimes we, I like to do walks. I do a lot with, uh, I was, I took, I taught a multiplication class last fall. Um, and we did a lot of walks um, through the neighborhood looking for arrays. Yeah. We did a raise one day. And then we um, looked for things that came in groups um, on a different day. And mm -hmm. the kids get so excited. The arrays especially are super fun to do in like a, like a more developed place because they're everywhere and they just got so excited you know they were on they were on the sidewalk they were on every pane of every window the yeah. grates on the window the you know the textured I don't know if may, some places have this we have like little textured things I think they're for like visually impaired people to tell them that that's the end of the like the, the intersection the walkway. Yeah. The cross rock. Yeah. and they're dots and they're huge it's like mm -hmm. I don't know I there were too many for them to figure out then, but we wrote it down and we went back and by, I thought it was like 15 by, I don't know, eight oh, or something. Yeah. Uh, it was too much for them to figure out in the moment, but we kind of like took a picture mm -hmm. and then we took it back and remade it and kind of figured out how to section it, you know? Yep. Well, and yeah, we've got, you know, manhole covers and those all have grates on it that we can do the arrays with. We often and do coral fun. counting examples with the flower petals because five yes. is a very common number out in nature. And so groups. five, ten. 
groups. Yeah. Groups are easy to do in either environment, things that come Mm -hmm. in groups. You know, we found lots of plants and trees. I love street trees. I have another, I have a love affair with street trees (laughs) because I feel like they're an underutilized, um, you know, you, anyone that lives in a, a place that has a lot of trees, you know, has that resource and maybe may, they may or may not take advantage of it. But yeah. if, if you're in the, in an urban environment, many people don't think about, well, you don't have to go super far, but these street trees are mm-hmm. here and mm-hmm. they're often really interesting and intentionally planted yeah. and or historic. So um, and there's like whole people's jobs to manage these trees. Yeah. Um, and that's a super interesting thing that, I, you well, know. And I know our city has so much paperwork and information that you can just Google Port Moody uh, city trees and their spreadsheets with when they were planted, how big they are, how far apart they need to be. That's amazing. And so there's great ways to make the indoor outdoor connection with your classroom as well. So I think a lot of cities do have that information online. It's amazing. And they know, you know, they, they intentionally plant them in certain places yeah. um, and they have a lot more variety than you might find in your local forest. I know when I went to New York city, maybe this is why I have a love affair for street trees. I was like, what's this tree? I have never seen this tree in my life. That's a weird thing living in the Eastern United States. It's deciduous forest. That's where I grew up. And I was like, what is this tree? I've never heard of this tree. And I like figured it out. It was a ginkgo tree, obviously. I didn't know what it was, but they were all over planted in New York City. And they're so cool. They have the coolest shaped leaves. Yeah. Yeah. I I was the nerdy teacher that like, brought in piles of leaves in New York City and dumped them on my kids desk <laughs> and because yeah. they didn't know what a forest was yeah um we actually had to go to the botanical garden New York City botanical garden to go to a mm-hmm. forest mm-hmm. I mean it's fine it's a different set of knowledge I yeah. didn't know what the subway was yeah. they, they can ride the subway it's a different set of knowledge um but yeah so that was my trees are my my, my street trees. Very cool. Well, and so you have a variety of teaching in, in many different contexts and settings. So what are some overall challenges or barriers that you've had or experienced implementing outdoor education in traditional classroom settings? Well, it's a special ed teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the kids that are runners you Mm -hmm. in that in that kind of context if I was to take the classrooms I've had in the past outside you need uh you can't go by yourself yeah um you need you know at least a teacher's aid and all the adults really you can muster Mm -hmm. um and if you can hook in your like speech pathologist or you know OT would be a great one Mm -hmm. um and it really, you really have to hammer in on practicing those routines and just going outside and really start small steps. If you have that kind of situation um, and have a plan in place, if you do have kids that might take off and, and practice mm-hmm. coming out, coming in to a signal or whatever, and like going as far as you can see me and mm-hmm. comfortable. It's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. Um, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. Um the other thing is gear. Yeah. Um, I think it's, in, it's, it's two ways. Um, I think as adults, we need to make sure that we have the correct gear, whether you're a teacher or a parent mm-hmm. or a parent's coming in to help. Um, we often ignore ourselves and I am very guilty of this. Um, when I would go visit forest preschool, mm-hmm. I didn't have the gear. My kid had gear but I didn't have the gear. It's expensive, yeah. but I don't, I don't grow. I'm yeah. not going to grow out of my boots. So investing in myself is, is a good, you know, a good thing and it'll last longer than my three-year-old. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's okay to invest in good gear. Um, good long underwear, you know, mm-hmm. if you're in a cold climate, like we do, I was just saying it's cold today. It's August. <laughs> I have my wool on. Wow. Uh, but, and then, and gear, getting gear for kids can mm-hmm. be um, difficult. I've, I worked on some pretty 
um, low income schools and um, there's ways around it. And I, yeah. I you know, a lot of gear libraries, yeah. garage sales can be fantastic donations, swaps, you know, there's a lot of ways around it. There's a lot of grants yes. I, for people that you can get grants for kids gear, but getting it for the teachers is a different story. That's why I always bring up the, because mm -hmm. if you're cold, you're not going to stay. <laughs> no, or miserably absolutely. Wet. Um, yeah. So yeah. 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 And I know I've had students in the past that were runners and we definitely went out with our teacher's aid. We went out with our student services teacher and we started really small, the same way we start any routine indoors. We would go out very short periods of time at the beginning of the year. And all of our expectations or boundaries were all introduced through games. And so that's how that's we set great. up cones yes. and play a game, then come back. That is great. Can, we, can we do the same game without the cones? Oh, no, we can't. All right, let's put the cones back out. No harm done. We'll just keep practicing right. and a lot of repetition. I know it can seem really mundane <laughs> to take such slow steps, but it really does pay off. Yeah, it makes a difference. And I know, in, at least in my experience, it can seem really repetitive to us, mm -hmm. but um it's not necessarily repetitive to them. Yeah. Um, I, my, my son loves and needs so much more repetition than I think is necessary most of the time. And I have to remind myself. Yeah. Um, and it's just a trait I've noticed after working with a lot of different kids that we mm -hmm. may think it's super repetitive, but you know, they really need even more repetition than we right. even think. And so, yeah. Uh, just keep going, keep yeah. trying. Steps. I love the game idea. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, as it's like, it's repetition, but it's through a different lens. And so it seems really playful. Yeah, no, yeah. and that's a great way to do it. It keeps it super positive and mm -hmm. fun for everyone else too, like all the other kids, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. All right. I definitely want to ask you about assessment or documentation as well, because I know that's a big part with curriculum and parents or administrators thinking that you're wasting time outside and it's not attached to curriculum. So do you have any strategies or advice about how to assess or evaluate, document student learning with your yeah, needs based so lessons? What I almost kind of think of it in a different way. So I kind of think about what you're already teaching and required to teach and how you can translate it. Mm -hmm. Or, or if you have a, resources like my book or whatever you might have, you can match up those um, those concepts. So like we were talking about, if you are teaching multiplication and arrays, then mm -hmm. you're teaching multiplication and arrays outside. So there's really nothing different, right? Like I'm still teaching this, you know, core concept or the skill that I'm supposed to teach. I'm yeah. teaching it. Or instead of those plastic manipulatives you gave me, we're using pine cones you know, and I take a ton of pictures, um, so that I always have the proof. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important. Um, some teachers like to do, um, like have a clipboard and have, have you, I don't know if you've ever seen this. So like, um, if I had a class of 20 students, I'd have a, a, a sheet that I kind of like made. This yep. is just, but you Thanks. make, you know, with boxes and you have every kid in your class's name in a box and you're going around while they're working on an activity mm -hmm. and you're talking with them and jotting down notes of what you observe, what they're doing, what they're having trouble with. Um, and you keep that all together. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe you're focusing on one thing when you do that. Some days it might just be general observations mm -hmm. and then some days it might be well I I'm gonna look around everyone today while they're doing this specific activity doing I don't know these multiplication problem cards or whatever that I have outside and I'm gonna see how each one of them is doing with their understanding of multiplication and kind of just write down really quickly where I think they are yeah you know and make a star next to who I think needs some more practice yeah you know, that kind of thing. I'm not a formal tester. Well, and I think there's, there's a lot to be said for balance. Even inside the classroom, we don't evaluate every single thing right. that the child says or draws or writes. And so it's finding a balance 
between conversations and work done, um, even just observing how they're engaging outside. And so I think, as you said, it's just finding and that balance. Yeah, the same that. things you might do in your classroom. If you do exit slips, yeah. or whatever you may call them, you know, the mm -hmm. one final task that they have to do before they can go to the next thing, yeah. or um, you can still do that outside. You can still do like written work outside yeah. um, in all but certain types of weather, right? Mm -hmm. um, without getting too socky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so maybe that's the day you don't do that, you know? Yeah. Or in, in the chalk, you can take pictures of that or they can take what they did with the chalk or the manipulatives and then draw mm -hmm. it or write the number sentence or whatever mm -hmm. they did or describe what they did yeah. with a partner. Yeah. Um, and then there's your documentation too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was just watching one of your YouTube videos on doing, um, uh, nature lines or number lines, excuse number me, lines. Of nature, oh, right. Lines. And it's yes. a wonderful routine indoors. And now we're taking it outdoors. It doesn't mean you have to assess it outdoors every single time again, but it's something that's consistent and predictable between indoors and outdoors, which I really love. Right. Or you, um, I don't know. I, we did a lot with like hundred charts mm -hmm. and I have a giant like class size cloth number chart or hundred chart that goes outside. So if you're teaching a lesson on hundred charts and they're adding two digit numbers, and then you're coming back and you're talking about it, just like you would in, in, on the carpet in your classroom, yeah. you can do that outside with your big, you know, there's no it's no different. These things can go outside. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, oh, wonderful. Thank you. Now I know our time is wrapping up. So before I ask you for a novelty nature note, is there anything else you'd like to add about taking curriculum outdoors? Well, we covered that you can go no matter where you are, you can no go outside. I did want to say that um, there's a lot of, there's some research out there that I find really intriguing, um, that it doesn't even matter what you do outside. Mm. It's kind of just going. So even if you took your exact same lesson, you did absolutely nothing special. You never touched a pine cone and you had the kids bring workbooks outside. Nothing wrong with workbooks. I have a kid that loves workbooks. It's fine. Um, and that's all you did. And then you came back mm -hmm. that they've shown that that still gives you a lot of the benefits of increased engagement, attitude, attention. And then it actually spills over into your next lesson. Yeah. So you're kind of getting a two for one deal. Yeah. And and it's free. So like going outside is free. It's a it's more work in the beginning a little bit, but mm -hmm. everything we do in the beginning in our classroom, we spend a long time working on procedures and getting kids if you do centers or what we do during while well, I'm meeting with a small group right so yeah. we put in a lot of that work inside too we just don't think of it uh, in the same way that's you know? true thank you for that all right so a novelty nature note I'll quickly start we have been observing a lot of water striders recently with my uh, four-year-old son asking so many questions about how they walk on water so we've been learning all about how their legs are covered in just hundreds of tiny hairs, which trap the water, excuse me, trap the air to help keep them buoyant. And we also learned that they can actually live up to a year as long as the temperature is not freezing. That's interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. They are they come out very soon in the spring. They do. But... Yeah. When their larva hatches. Yeah. 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 I, they're, they're a fun Fun little insect for sure. Mm -hmm. So my nature, you're ready for my maze. So yeah, yeah, you know, I talked about trees. So I'm gonna yep. talk about trees some more. Um, and I've been looking a lot at different leaf shapes, and there's a ton out there, but there's the simple and the compound, and then there's so the compound leaves have really long stems, and then they have all these smaller leaves, which most of us just think are leaves, mm -hmm. but they're actually leaflets, and that whole piece. So think of a locust or a black walnut has a really long with all of the leaves on the either side and one on the end, or um, a horse chestnut or a buckeye. Yeah. I don't know if you have those in British Columbia, but um, they have like all their leaves come from the center and there's usually five leaflets coming from the center and one long stem. 
and those are compound leaves. They're two different kinds of compound leaves. And I just think it's cool when you start noticing these differences yeah. in which trees have, you know, which ones are compound, which ones are palmate compound, but or regular palmate, like a like a maple leaf. Yeah. So palm, looks like your palm, but then a uh, chestnut or buckeye is a palmate with each leaf coming from. Very cool. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Uh, again, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I encourage everyone to look up Discover Wild Learning, your website. There's so many great blog posts. And again, your YouTube videos are really easily accessible for educators and for parents. And you can follow a, her journey on Instagram also at Discover Wild Learning. So thank Thanks you so for much for being here. Yeah. Awesome. A last bit of fun information. I have this new workshop called Nature's Path, A Year of Monthly Sparks. If you visit www.teachoutdoors.ca, you can find out more information. In essence, you receive 12 mini workshops that most schools are playing during their monthly staff meetings or during lunch and learn sessions. Each month, there are resources to download to help you get outside more easily, as well as some suggested podcast episodes to listen to. Also being released soon is the Nature Classroom Podcast Series, a short six-episode series where we talk about how to begin your outdoor learning journey. Follow at teachoutdoors.ca on Instagram for updates. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the Teach Outdoors podcast, where we explore the world of outdoor learning and play. Keep exploring, stay curious, and tune in for more adventures.